The controversy in the United States over undocumented immigrants continues to grow. Cameroon takes on Boko Haram with a ban on the face veil, but some say their rights are being infringed. And Kenyan athletic officials reject accusations of massive doping. Africa 54 starts right now. Good evening and welcome. I'm Vincent McCorry. This is Africa 54. The European migrant crisis took a violent turn on Friday when a Macedonian uh, riot police clashed with an angry crowd of migrants using tear gas, stun grenades and barriers of barbed wire to hold the crowds at bay. The migrants are among the thousands of refugees from the Middle East, Africa and Asia who have been crossing from Greece into Macedonia and now the Balkan country is cracking down. Macedonia has declared a state of emergency and is deploying army troops to border regions. Authorities say that while official border crossings will remain open, they're going to reduce illegal border entry to a minimum. Petros Mastakos with the UNHCR is calling for more humanitarian assistance for migrants in limbo on the Greek side of the border. There are hundreds of vulnerable persons, children, babies, other persons with, with, with extreme vulnerabilities, including medical needs. Most of them, if not all of them, stay rough in the open air. We do appeal to the Greek authorities to take all necessary measures to address the humanitarian needs of the persons gathered on the borderline. In July, some 50,000 migrants arrived in Greece and many tried to press north through Macedonia to reach Serbia and then enter the EU in Hungary. If any of these migrants make it to Germany, the experience might be totally different. Residents of the Berlin House Project invite migrants to leave, cook and eat with them. This is the integration that Berlin's pilot plan, Sharehouse Refugio, intends to create. Organizers hope that this gives the foreign residents enough time to get acquainted with Germany by creating their own network of friends and colleagues and pass on their place in the house to other interested parties. Iyad Ibrahim Aga was born in the Syrian city of Homs. He escaped with 200 other men, women and children from Egypt via boat to Greece. About a year ago, he arrived in Germany and lived in a hostel before moving into the house in Newark, Köln. I have here a big chance to interact with people and get to know more about the German society and have more friends and maybe I can have a chance to find a good job. If I, if I have my own flat, maybe I will never have this much of connections like now so i think yeah all all the refugees like me needs this opportunity ayad is now busy learning german as he wants to integrate quickly faduma musa afra a native of somalia considers a new lodging as a gift everybody was somebody back home here you come you're nothing so who do you want to be this is an individual sacrifice. It's from within the individual, yes. But there's also that sacrifice, the motivation from the community. And this is the, 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 the reward, the present they gave us to live with the rest in peace, in harmony and everything. And it's, it's, it's amazing. It's, it's, I don't know what to talk about it. Migrants in Germany are also getting help from Welcome in Mulheim. A free shop founded in July 2014 that collects and distributes donations in order to provide migrants with the necessary supplies for starting their life in Germany anew. Well, the controversy in the United States of undocumented immigrants is rising, and it's now a key topic on the campaign trail for the U.S. presidency in 2016. Republican presidential contender Donald Trump says American born children of immigrants living in the U.S. illegally should be denied citizenship. But undocumented immigrants and advocacy groups say those without visas should be allowed to stay. A viewer as Deborah Block looks at the argument. People illegally crossing the border from Mexico make their way into the United States in many ways, even as U.S. Customs and Border Patrol agents continue to secure the border. Maya recalls the night she made that crossing into Texas 10 years ago. I knew I was going to have many problems because I'm undocumented. But at the same time, so many of us have moved forward in life even though we don't have documents. Maya followed her boyfriend, now husband, who also came to the U.S. illegally from Mexico. They have an eight-year-old daughter who was born in Maryland and is a U.S. citizen. My biggest fear is that I might be deported or put in prison. 
but illegal immigrants should be deported, says Dan Stein, president of the Federation for American Immigration Reform. There are hundreds of millions of people who would like to move to the United States. It can't be a self-selecting process for anyone who feels that they might do better, improve their economic situation. But the idea of a mass deportation is ridiculous, says George Escobar of Casa de Maryland, a Latino advocacy group in Maryland. It's more cost efficient and beneficial for the American economy if something is dealt, if they're legalized and there's a, there's a path to legalization. Adding fuel to the immigration controversy are sanctuary cities, 276 cities and 32 states that do not allow the police to stop and question people simply to determine their immigration status. Stein says police should be able to question people they suspect are in the country illegally. This needs to be part of the day-to-day -day policing in state and local communities. But Escobar says the police would be overstepping their bounds. Any kind of collaboration between federal immigration officials and local municipal police is, is totally uncalled for. Both men are in agreement about one thing, however, that the U.S. immigration system needs to be overhauled. There's no question that you can't just leave the door open and, and keep a flow coming in, but you've got to be able to look at patterns of migration. Stein has a different proposal. People do need to leave the country and conform with the law and then reapply for admission based on the visas that are available. Last year, President Barack Obama issued an executive order that would allow about half of the undocumented immigrants to stay in the country. But those opposed to the initiative have challenged the order in court. Deborah Block, VOA News, Washington. Well, attacks by Islamist militant group has uh, forced at least 40,000 in Chad to flee their homes in the last two weeks, according to the aid agency Médecins Sans Frontières. Also shaken by Boko Haram's terrorist attacks, Cameroonian authorities have launched an awareness campaign to mobilize citizens against further violence. In the capital Yaoundé, volunteers from the collective for a united Cameroon fan out to give commuters and passers-by thousands of leaflets and blossomed uh, with a um, rather emblazoned with a free phone number they can call if they see anything suspicious t-shirts and posters with a campaign logo reading stop terrorism and remain united also being distributed uh, the government has also imposed restrictions on the wearing of hijab and closed mosques and islamic schools in the most sensitive parts of the country but some feel the measures are infringing on their rights with the issue of Boko Haram, we can no longer dress like uh, we used to dress before. Because uh, when you ha wear a hijab, for you to enter some offices, uh, it is very complicated. Even to have taxi, even to go out in the market and all that, it is very complicated. They find you like a suspect, maybe somebody who's wearing a bomb on you them and which leads to policemen, police women searching you. There's no difference between a man searching a man or a woman searching a woman. So I think with the issue of terrorism, dressing in hijab has become very, very difficult. Well, Cameroon has already deployed some 7,000 troops alongside soldiers from Chad, Niger, and Nigeria to tackle Boko Haram's six-year insurgency, which has threatened the stability of the Lake Chad region. Not too far from there, Libya's internationally recognized government is urging Arab countries to launch airstrikes against Islamic State affiliated militants who have carried out uh, beheadings and crucifixions and taken control of the city of Sirte. Uh, the U.S. and five European nations condemned the atrocities but continued to back political dialogue as a means to bring stability to Libya's fractured government. VOA's Pam Dawkins has more. After an emergency meeting on Tuesday, the Arab League pledged support for Libya's call for military assistance, but did not offer any specifics. The Islamic State-related unrest comes as Libya grapples with divisions between an elected parliament and government that controls the East and an Islamist militia-backed government based in Tripoli. U.S. officials say the best way for Libya to counter terrorism is to create a safe environment through a unified government. We continue to support the U.N.-led process to, to, to get to that end. But there is concern the U.N. process will have a limited impact. It's one thing to do diplomacy through the U.N. process, but it's just incomplete without any sort of strategy that has these security components to it. 
The U.S. and Egypt are among countries that have launched limited airstrikes against militant targets in Libya. But Washington appears reluctant to adopt a broader strategy, says Katulis, who served on a U.N. panel on Libya. I think there's a certain understandable risk aversion um, to U.S. military action, direct intervention, and even support when you look at dynamics around the region, when you look at our own recent experience in the Iraq war and other places. Reluctance to deal with Libya's fractured government could also be playing a role in the U.S. decision to limit its response. The risk of giving military assistance to the internationally recognized side, if you will, is that it would feed a narrative that the U.S. is intervening and choosing sides and so on. She adds the U.S. has a lot of fires burning in the region as it continues to grapple with Islamic State militant attacks in Iraq and Syria. Pam Dawkins, VOA News, the State Department. We want to know what you think about Africa 54 and the stories we covered. Join the conversation on Facebook. The address is Africa 54. And check out our headlines 24-7 on voaafrica.com. Coming up, a new technique produces disease-free bananas. Stay with us. This is Bizbeat. Egypt has completed the expansion of the Suez Canal, a massive three-year project finished in just one. Egyptians themselves helped finance the canal, buying nearly $5 billion worth of bonds for the $8.5 billion project. Cairo resident Ali Assad. He says no one in Egypt or outside believed that it could be achieved in such a period. He says the best part of it is it was financed by the Egyptian people. At ETX Capital, analyst David Papier says the larger canal could carry additional benefits. They are looking to increase infrastructure, housing, health care. You know, the, the opening of this new canal could bring these things to Egypt, and it also could increase, you know, exports from other nations and, and other multinational companies. The number of ships passing through the canal will nearly double to 97 a day, and the annual earnings for Egypt are expected to more than double to over $13 billion a year. For VOA's BizBeat, I'm Philip Alexio. How do you see the world? I see countries in turmoil. I see our planet changing. I see people at peace. No matter how you see the world, you'll get an unbiased and uncensored view of it on Voice of America, on television, radio, online, and mobile. In more than 40 languages all day, every day, millions of people tune us in. How do I see the world? On Voice of America. Welcome back now to Science and Agriculture, where a modern technique is helping farmers in Kenya reap maximum benefits. Africa 54's Health Kidui, you were, uh, Esther Kidui, you were, is here to tell us more. Yes, indeed, Vincent. Researchers in Kenya have developed a new technique that is helping farmers in Trans Nzoia County produce disease resistant bananas that give higher yields. Many farmers in that region of Kenya are excited about this new technique. Ruben Wabuke is inspecting banana seedlings at his nursery in Kitale, western Kenya. He says the improved seedlings bring in good money. Wabuke is one of thousands of farmers living in Trans Nzoia County who are embracing new farming skills to reduce reliance on staples like maize. The first lot we received was 2,500 from the county government and then Everything was sold and uh, we are seeing that this is a project which will have to continue because as I have always thought and uh, I always have, have been educated by the government officers, we need to now do what we call diversification in our farming practices in Transoya because maize has actually put us nowhere. This fertile region of Kenya is known for its maize harvests, but poor infrastructure and unpredictable weather has seen many farmers count losses in recent years. Scientists at the Jomo Kenyatta University of Agriculture and Technology are working to change this scenario by providing farmers with improved banana varieties which mature faster than conventional ones. Dr. Grace Wacheke Mungai is a researcher at the university. How we do the tissue culture is that we go to the farmers. Uh, maybe a farmer has uh, this uh, unique plant or this variety which they see it's producing very well 
which has very unique qualities. We get the sucker from them. We just come and do the service sterilization to remove the contaminants, uh, that is the bacteria and the fungi. And uh, then we, we do the, the process of the multiplication and the cleaning. Experts say this new technique could be a blueprint for a 21st century farming revolution in Africa. It's also a wake-up call for African governments who, after decades of neglect, seem to take notice of the importance of investing in agriculture, especially for food security. Patrick Haeba is the governor of Transnzoya County. In uh, 2014, we introduced tissue culture banana. Uh, we thought that uh, this crop is easy to take care of, and especially with the tissue culture banana, uh, which comes along without any pathogens or diseases. And uh, production starts, uh, you start harvesting within maybe 12 months, and after that the harvest is a bit continuous. Another farmer, Maurice Wanyoni, and his wife Alice are attending a training session on how to prune tissue culture bananas and prevent diseases. He is excited that they will fetch him good returns. The money I make, seen from every plant, I harvest from each plant three times a year. Each bunch goes for $6, which gives me about $17. If I sell at $5 a bunch, I get about $8,640 per year. But with maize, I used to make about $300 per year. So bananas give me more money. I make about $720 a month. Many farmers, however, still need more information about improved seeds and training in better crop management in order to reap maximum yields. And on a continent where food security is a huge challenge, this new farming technique is a welcome change, and especially so for poor households. Vincent? Most certainly. Well, it's time now for a short break. Uh, still to come on Africa 54, Kenyan athletic officials respond to charges of massive doping. We'll be right back. just joined us, I'm Mariama Diallo, and here is a quick recap of today's headlines. In Cameroon, a nationwide campaign is initiated at the beginning of August to urge citizens to be vigilant against Boko Haram attacks. In South Africa, the grandson of the late Nelson Mandela arrives at court to face a charge of rape. We stay in South Africa where Oscar Pistorius, who was due to leave prison Friday, but in a surprise move, the country's justice minister put Pistorius's parole on hold. And finally, in Morocco, King Mohammed VI says that visas imposed by his country to nationals of a number of Arab countries for security reasons related to terrorism were, quote, unfortunate. That's all for today. Thanks for watching. We'll see you next time. back to Africa 54. Here's what's trending. Now, the Forbes list of the world's highest paid actresses is out. Oscar winner Jennifer Lawrence came out on top. Uh, the Hunger Games star brought in $52 million this year. The Hunger Games trilogy has grossed uh, $2.3 billion worldwide so far. Scarlett Johansson is a run-up on the list with $35.5 million in the bank. The star's financial success is attributed to the turn in uh, super... Uh, hero films including Avengers, Age of Ultron, uh, Bridesmaids, Funny Woman, uh, Melissa McCarthy proves a star power banking $23 million last year. 
Our film Spy and Tammy reached a combined total of $335 million gross. Also in the top five are Charles, uh, Chinese actress uh, Fan Bingbing and newlywed Jennifer Aniston. Well, next up, mobile phone technology is constantly becoming faster, smarter, and more complex. But for some sections of society, that is not always a good thing. A startup tech company in London prides itself on making perhaps the world's simplest mobile phone, allowing, allowing older people, the disabled, and various other groups an easy outlet to the outer world. The own phone can be programmed with up to 12 different contacts and receive calls too. The user-friendly device is easy to hold and features large types uh, that, that are easier on the eyes than the average smartphone. Well, and finally, an unusual trend from South Korea. Eating alone can often be a lonely experience. But for one South Korean teenager, his dinner and a webcam have created an unlikely recipe for Internet fame. Every evening, 14-year-old Kim Son Jin goes to a small room in his family's home and uh, gorges on food as he uh, chats before a live camera with hundreds, uh, sometimes thousands of teenagers watching. And the show makes uh, Kim money. He earned uh, $1,700 in his most successful ep episode. In South Korea, um, Arika TV, an app uh, for live broadcasting online video, has become a big player in the Internet uh, subculture and a critical, uh, a rather crucial part of social life uh, for teens. And that is what is trending today. Well, it's time now for a Friday sports report. Here's Sonny Young with the sunny side of sports. Sonny, what's on tap on the World uh, Championships in China? Well, Vincent, I'll tell you about it. But first, sporty greetings once again to our Africa 54 viewers. The 15th IAAF World Championships in athletics begin this weekend in China. The drums are beating in Beijing ahead of the nine-day competition, which is being held at the National Stadium one of the African athletes I'll be watching closely is David Rudisha, who we see there in the sunglasses. The Olympic 800-meter champion and world record holder from Kenya did not compete at the 2013 World Championships in Moscow because of a knee injury. The men's 800-meter final is August 25th in Beijing. The Kenyans were the top-performing African team at the last World Championships winning 12 medals, including five gold. Meanwhile, Kenyan athletic officials are rejecting recent allegations of massive doping by Kenyan athletes over the last 15 years. Lenny Ruvaga reports from Nairobi. This is the high-performance training camp in Eldoret, some 300 kilometers from Nairobi. Opened 18 years ago, it draws elite athletes from Kenya and South Sudan who have in the recent past won various international championships and Olympic medals. Today, Jimmy Simbel, who has been a coach for more than 40 years, is having his athletes undergo an endurance session. Asked about the doping allegations, Simba denies Kenyan athletes have used steroids to boost their performance. Lucky that we have uh, natural food here. The tomatoes are natural, we have vegetables, we have, name it. And then that is what we use. And then they have training. The training, and uh, okay, uh, we have the knowledge of doing it. Kenya was rocked earlier this year when marathon star Rita Jepto was banned for two years after being caught doping with banned blood boosting hormone EPO. The East African country has had its reputation as a distance running power eroded by the doping claims. But the head of Athletics Kenya says there is zero tolerance for doping. And uh, when one is convicted of doping, you're definitely suspended. According to Athletics Kenya, more than 30 Kenyan athletes have failed doping tests in the past five years. The chairman of the National Olympics Committee Kenya Kipchoge Keino was adamant that doping has no place in athletics. My opinion is that whoever is found using drugs should be fine for life. There's no need to encourage people, 
using such things for their, for their life and for their success. Kenyan athletes will join others from around the world in Beijing to compete in the World Championships later this month. Lenny Ruvaga for VOA News, Nairobi. Thanks, Lenny. I'm VOA Sonny Young, and that's the sunny side of sports. Vincent? Well, thanks a lot, Sonny, and be sure to watch the sunny side of sports every Monday and Friday right here on Africa 54. Well, that's our show for today. Be sure to watch Africa 54 on our website at voaafrica.com. For more news, tune in to VOA's evening radio show, African News Tonight at 1800 UTC. And in the mornings today, break Africa between 0300 and 0600 UTC, Monday through Friday. Now, we end our show today with the sound of a Malian power trio, Isa a Tory group that blends uh, modern rock sounds with traditional sounds. This tune is uh, uh, called Out Care, meaning the peace. Good night from Washington. Music is something that brings people together. Music educates, it motivates, it's a bridge. Music. Alley. On. VOA. Kubana VOA. Wahan kuso gudbinna kubana yal goz goz awo hi sabbadano kusab sana rimaha Somalia. Maraikan ka iyo alam kaba. Haddaba kubana ha VOA da kala soo wopsayt ke na VOA Somali dot com. From VOA Learning English, this is the Technology Report. I'm Milar Sega. I'm the host of VOA's The Correspondence. A roundup of the world's top stories. Here's a false choice in more ways than one. We can't actually put you there, but we can come pretty close. In 30 minutes, we'll show you the world.
The controversy 